Thank you, Ingrid, and thank you for not introducing Brent, because it saves me having to explain that I'm not Brent, but he does send his apologies for not being here. So let me give you a brief 15-minute um, discussion on geospatial convergence and uh, our view on how geospatial technology is transforming industrial processes, uh, workflows, um, throughout a whole range of industries. But before I do that, let's just take a moment to reflect on history. Um, Last year was the 500th anniversary of the birth of Mercator. Uh, in, in modern day t terms, he was born in Belgium, but less than 100 kilometers from here in Rupermont. And he, he lived through a period of European history, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, the Renaissance. Um, and that was a period of very rapid development across a whole range of fields of science and technology and art. In a relatively short period of time, there was an exponential growth uh, in knowledge and technology. And one of those uh, technologies was printing. And printing enabled not just books and knowledge to be accessible to larger numbers of people, many more people than ever before, but also maps. Um, and I, I wonder what Mercator would make of the world we live in today and the geospatial technologies that we have access to. But I also wonder if we are not living through a similar period in history. Sometimes hard to see that when you're in the middle of it, but I think history may look back at us uh, and look at the explosive development of technology and how the internet has made information accessible in a way that printing did in Mercator's time. Uh, who's to say? Now, I would say that geospatial information has moved through eras since Mercator's time. Not to say that uh, geospatial information wasn't around before Mercator's time, but certainly if we take the printed map as the starting point, um, for centuries, paper maps were used by everybody. Um, you know, we all use paper maps and they underpin, or for a long time they, they were key to so much human activity. Um, and uh, as we explored uh, and developed the economy and found our way around, paper maps were key to that. And in the last 50 years, we've seen the digitization of paper maps. And we've seen what happens when you can couple digital map data with other kinds of data uh, and what kind of analysis can be done uh, and the capabilities that have developed uh, with, with GIS, but not just with GIS, also in personal navigation systems, in the use of geospatial data uh, in our everyday lives. But as we move into a new area, era, it's about convergence, it's about building virtual worlds, but it's also about the flow of information. Uh, certainly in the, in the days of paper maps, the flow was quite linear. Specialists made maps and they published them and then people used them and human cognition was used to make decisions using that information, but it was quite a linear process. The era we're moving into is much more about flow and geospatial information is becoming increasingly embedded uh, in the processes and it's becoming increasingly a conversation and it's becoming increasingly a feedback loop. And uh, the big buzzwords are, you know, the big buzzword is big data, and uh, geospatial data is no exception to that. Our ability to create geospatial information today is somewhat, in some areas, outpacing our ability to absorb it um, and to use it and to create intelligence out of it. And so one of the areas of development today is around using artificial intelligence and using new technologies and new analytics to be able to look at massive data sets and pull information and intelligence out in a way that it just wouldn't be practical for a human being to do uh, in the way that they traditionally use geospatial information. In terms of convergence, I would point to two kinds of convergence that's going on. So in terms of sensors and our ability to create geospatial information, there is clearly a convergence. Um, we've had developments of different streams of technology, whether it's angle measurement, distance measurement, photogrammetry, global positioning, inertial positioning. Um, and what you're seeing is those technologies all coming together and in, into a single solution, uh, a mobile mapping solution as an example, which can create enormous amounts of information. You can drive down the road with a mobile mapping system and create six billion points of data an hour, uh, three-dimensional, uh, accurate, photo-rendered. We're also living in an age of drones, right? You can, these drones aren't remote control planes. You don't sit there on the ground and control them. You tell them where you want to survey and you launch them and they go and do it for you. Um, that's, but in terms of, so there's a convergence there in the, in the sensors and our ability to create spatial data. 
But there's also another convergence which we see as uh, equally important, which is the convergence of spatial data and geospatial contexts with our ability to connect and communicate in real time and with our ability to do more powerful analytics and our computational ability. And it's those three things coming together, so position, connectivity, and, and information processing and analytics. When those three things come together, we can do things that we couldn't do before, and this is where the real power of convergence is. So just to give one example um, of that, if you take, if you take the, the infrastructure that's required to precisely determine a position on Earth, let's say to centimeters, uh, you know, to one, two, or three, four centimeters. Historically, um, the infrastructure to do that were, was networks of pillars and geodetic monuments, and you had to use quite painstaking processes, processes to transfer those positions to a particular point. Now, over the past 15 to 20 years, we've seen those passive monuments replaced by active control networks, which are essentially GNSS receivers or virtual reference systems that are active and real-time and providing real-time information. But where that's going, and, and in using this convergence of, of, uh, of technology, what we can do today uh, is take a global tracking network, such as the one you see there, um, we can feed data from all those stations around the world into a server. Uh, we can do very powerful analytics on that data very quickly because of the computation capabilities available today. And we can do analytics around GNSS satellites, how they're moving in space, what their clocks are doing, what the Earth's atmosphere is doing in real time globally. And then we can use our global connectivity to send the, that data back out to users on Earth. And what that means is the technology exists today to step outside and get an accurate position to centimeters without reference to any local infrastructure. Now here in the Netherlands, that might not be such a big deal because you, so much real-time infrastructure here anyway, but in Africa or in you know, parts of Russia, that's a huge leap forward. But what it means is that the, our ability to position ourselves to high precision um, will become available to more people. And uh, you know, I, I would argue in our lifetimes we'll, we'll be positioning our cars to higher accuracy so we know which lane we're in and so on. Um, but it's an example of how analytics, communication, and geospatial context can come together today to do things that we just couldn't do before. More broadly, uh, just like paper maps became very key to so much human activity, geospatial information and geospatial technology is becoming key across entire work processes, across a whole set of industries. Um, and it's, it, as I mentioned before, it's a flow of data, it's a feedback loop. So whether it's in agriculture or construction, uh, in natural resources, mining, uh, energy, utilities. What we're seeing increasingly is the use of geospatial information from end to end across an entire flow. Um, so in the agriculture case, you know, a, a harvester can be driven at night in the dark down the exact same rows that were planted in the season before because the information is known and preserved. And that harvester can measure where yields are better or worse within a field, and that information can be fed back into the following season to be more precise and intelligent about where fertilizers or pesticides are used. Um, the same in the construction world. Uh, BIM is about 3D modeling. It's a spatial context where buildings can be brought together virtually in 3D digitally so that mistakes are made digitally, not actually on site and so on. Now to give one example, if you take the energy generation, transmission and distribution industry, it's one example, but just to illustrate how geospatial information is used across the whole process. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the construction of infrastructure, in the building of new power stations or power plants, in the building of new transmission lines, automation is taking place, which heavily depends on location, precise position, 3D modeling, BIM, 3D models that are loaded onto machines to automate the processes of earth moving, 3D models that are put into robots that help set out the building. Um, in, in generation or in transmission, um, we can take geospatial information and we can apply analytics to analyze millions of potential 
alignments or potential routes for those transmission lines, taking in all kinds of parameters, engineering, but also environmental and so on, and coming up with the best uh, alignment. Um, again, using analytics that would take human beings dozens of years to achieve. And then geospatial information is used in the, in the build out of distribution networks. It's also used if you're looking at um, vegetation management, for example, you know, power lines get uh, knocked out by trees getting blown down, so operators have to manage that. Increasingly, they're using airborne or ground-based scanning data to do that, and then using artificial intelligence or tools that can look through those data sets and find situations that you're looking for uh, where, where the vegetation needs to be managed, but it's an automation of the process. Um, and then through the operations and asset management, even if your power goes out, you know, people hate these systems where you call in and you don't speak to a human being, you speak to a machine. But when you do that, that, that voice response system is taking your phone number and your location and you become a geospatial data point. And the more people that call in, uh, the more data is available about who is out. And from that, algorithms can predict where the likely fault is in the network. That's all spatial analysis. And then from that fault point, fleet management systems can be used to determine where's the nearest crew that's suitably equipped and suitably trained to solve that particular problem. And so the nearest crew can be routed there and it gets the power back up uh, more quickly. If you're really lucky, you don't have to do any of that because you have a smart meter and uh, uh, networks today with smart meters look at where the power is on and off and you don't even have to call. You will wake up in the morning and you're digital clocks will be flashing and you'll, that's all you'll know about the power outage. But it's one example of where spatial information is used across an entire industry from end to end. And you could apply that same um, analysis to any, any of the other industries I showed there. And I, you know, I don't think we're done yet. There, there are new frontiers in geospatial. Um, Certainly 3D and 4D, people are becoming increasingly interested in change over time. I think one of our other speakers will talk about that uh, in a certain context. But also indoors, you know, why should our ability to navigate, why should our abil ability to find a way around stop when we come to a building? Why can't I continue to navigate through this building into one of the meeting rooms? Um, and the technology exists today to wheel around a building to map it very accurately in 3D, even though it's indoors. Um, and I, I think this is one of the, one of the big frontiers. Uh, also, intelligent transportation, I mentioned that. Um, you know, we are all distracted drivers, whether we like to admit it or not. Some are more distracted than others. Whenever somebody nearly crashes into me now, I just check, and I would say eight times out of ten, they're doing something with a handheld device. But the fact is, we'll probably become more distracted, and the technology in intelligent transportation is going towards uh, providing systems that help drivers keep in the lane, avoid traffic, even sort of cruise control, enhanced cruise control that lets you change lanes um, and lane guidance systems. But for those, if you look at that and if you look at its natural conclusion, which is autonomous vehicles, you know, autonomous vehicles aren't just science projects. You, there are autonomous vehicles today that can work in mines or on construction sites. There are autonomous vehicles that can work on roads. You can get a driver's license in the United States, California, Nevada, will give a driver's license to an autonomous car, and you can drive it around. And the technologies that are enabling that are familiar to all of us. It's high-precision GNSS, it's high-precision inertial and gyro, it's, uh, it's laser scanning. Um, but for, for, for precision transportation to make sense on the road, you've also got to have good data sets that know where the road edges are, where the lanes are, which are not, were not uh, entirely accessible today. Um, and also underground is another big frontier. There's, um, we, we don't know where things are under the ground and fairly frequent, except for here in the Netherlands where they know exactly where everything is. Um, and uh, of course, Crowdsourcing and sensors, there are billions of people today that are providing information, providing geospatial information, and this is a, a new frontier for us. Um, and I think in, in, the, in the consumer world of geospatial, that's already embraced. I think in the professional world, we have to increasingly look at that as a source of intelligence, um, where we may not want to provide authoritative national maps based on crowdsourcing, but we may want to use that information to determine where change has taken place. We may want to use it as a source of input and a source of intelligence. So at the macro level, um, I would argue that uh, at least half of the global economy, which is $70 trillion, uh, is made up of sectors that are 
dependent on geospatial information and will become increasingly so. So what we all do matters. We also can't affect, we can't uh, neglect the intangibles and the human benefits of what we do in the geospatial community. Um, you know, te the technologies we have are helping to find more effective ways to map the 75% of the world's land parcels that don't exist in any formal land title or cadastral system. Uh, that's a global problem and it's one where technology um, can help. Geospatial technology and the convergence of technology is also helping Earth scientists to better understand the Earth systems on a global holistic basis. Um, and that enables a better understanding of the geohazards uh, that exist, whether it's tectonic, earthquake, volcano, uh, weather related, um, and uh, can offer some path towards better prediction of those hazards and better understanding of the causes and likely events. So coming back to the analogy between paper maps and, uh, and where we stand today, you know, paper maps did become essential to so much of human activity and I would argue that modern geospatial data is no different in that regard. But the convergence of that geospatial data with connectivity, with analytics, with the computation power we have enables us to do so much more. Um, and I, you know, I think that's the exciting part of the, of, the, of the industry that we're in. And we certainly, um, we're not done yet, but I do wonder if uh, history won't look back on us as a, I don't know what they'll call it, but some, something analogous to the, uh, to the Renaissance. So finally, I would say, as they say here in the Netherlands, thank you, Al. Well.